All right, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is um, the first time I've done something like this. Um, I've done music uh, tutorials uh, for a while, but I've not actually uh, sat in front of a group and done a workshop before. Um, so it's something I've wanted to do for a while, and it's something I want to continue doing in the future. Um, so I'll probably learn many lessons from this. Um, but basically, my plan uh, for, for this was to I, I started writing a new track uh, a few weeks ago. Um, it was intended to be a bit different, um, kind of like a, an album track kind of thing where I was going to try some new ideas. And then I wanted to bring that track with me and just go through, uh, go through it with you kind of track by track and how I made it and why I did the things I did. Um, and as well as that, I've prepared uh, a bunch of slides, maybe about 15 slides, just to uh, talk about some uh, general observations and lessons and things I've learned. <clears throat> over the years that might be helpful or inspirational to you. Um, but let me just uh, tell you a bit about me first. Um, well, firstly, um, I, I have no formal music training, so uh, uh, this it's been really cool coming here. I've sat in on a few classes. It's been really inspirational. You guys are really lucky to be here. Um, I'm all self-taught with music. Um, and uh, basically, I studied physics um, at university. I did a a uh, master's degree in theoretical physics and a PhD in quantum physics, um, uh, which I finished in 2005. Um, during that whole time, I was still, music was still kind of my passion. Um, but I never really, <clears throat> when I was younger, I never really believed it was something I could do for a living uh, as a kind of uh, full time occupation. And uh, that was, I guess, a, a self limiting belief, which, uh, you know, is something I'll, I'll talk about later in regards to creativity. But um, yeah, when I was very young, you know, my, my love of music, you know, started very young. I don't know when exactly. And uh, I used to compile like mixtapes for my friends at uh, uh, primary school. And, uh, and that kind of evolved into me then uh, taking like parts of songs and uh, recording them and stopping it and then getting another song and starting it right there. So basically, my, my first kind of like, Sort of DJ mixes, if you will. Um, I got my first set of decks when I was about 14. Um, and then from there, I started DJing uh, sort of early 90s rave music. Um, and as I got into my sort of mid teens and I got a bit more rebellious, I started playing uh, hardcore and uh, jungle and things like that. Um, and this kind of uh, interest in electronic music just, uh, just kept going. I was always seeking new music. Uh, new sounds, and uh, uh, in the same time, I got my first computer uh, in the early 90s, which was an Amiga, which I some of you might remember, I don't know, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, there was music making software for that, which uh, was very, you know, very basic, simple, kind of like four tracks, um, and I used to make music kind of inspired by computer games at the time. Uh, and that's kind of how I started making music. <clears throat> And then, of course, the software just throughout the 90s just uh, evolved and got better and better. And eventually, I got my first PC. Um, and I got you know, more and more into music software. Uh, around about um, 2000, I got a, a new computer, which was you know, quite powerful. And uh, I started taking music production a bit more seriously. Um, it was always just kind of something I did you know, for fun. Um, and uh, around about 2000, and one, I heard uh, breaks. Um, I went to a club in London called The End, and I heard breaks for the first time, and I was uh, super inspired. Um, I'd been playing, as I say, like hardcore and jungle all throughout the 90s, and I was kind of fed up with it. I was kind of outgrowing it at that point, and I uh, didn't really know where I was going to go next with music. So uh, I started uh, DJing breaks and trying to uh, learn some of the production techniques uh, to make that kind of music. Uh, a few years later, I went to my first festival and heard Psychedelic Trance, and that kind of just changed my life forever. Um, but, you know, I still loved breaks as well, and uh, I decided to try and fuse the kind of sounds from Psychedelic Trance music into Breakbeat, which uh, really kind of unknown to me at the time, hardly anyone had actually done before, uh, maybe just a few artists. So uh, I, started, I started working on this, uh, this sound, this kind of psychedelic breaks, um, and eventually had my first track released in 2005. And since then, I've uh, had about, I think, 20, 25 tracks released. Um, 
and I've I guess I've become I've become known for kind of developing uh, like a new a new kind of subgenre of electronic dance music. Uh, some people call it cybreaks. Uh, I like to call it psychedelic tech funk. Um, I'll I'll talk more about that soon. Um, yeah, and uh, two years ago, just over two years ago, um, I well l let me go back. So I, I I finished my PhD in physics in 2005. Um, I was kind of fed up with science by then. It was bloody hard work and uh, quite dull, and I'd had no money for <laughs> basically all my youth, and uh, I wanted to just get out of science and get a job and kind of get on with my life and have some fun. So I got a job in IT, and uh, I worked in IT as a consultant for five years, uh, and I was pretty, pretty miserable the whole time. It's fair to say I was like quite unhappy um, and quite stressed out. And I would come home in the evenings and the weekends, and I would just work on music. And uh, that, you know, as I say, it got better and better. I had my first release in 2005. It was quite a while before I had my second release. Um, there weren't really any labels pushing the kind of sound that I was developing. Uh, eventually, my friend Dom started Broken Robot Records, uh, specifically to release my music and others like it. Um, and then... Uh, I carried on for about three years just making music in my spare time. And then two years ago, actually, on this, in the same month that my baby daughter was born, uh, I decided to quit my job and pursue uh, music as a full-time uh, career. And I haven't really looked back since. Uh, things have gone from strength to strength in the last two years. Um, I'm here now. You know, I've been touring uh, America, uh, the West Coast, for the for the second time, I was also here in September. Uh, I've done two tours of Australia and New Zealand, and I play regularly uh, all through the UK and Europe and Russia and uh, places like that. So, yeah, so here I am. Um, I'm going to, basically, the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some slides, maybe four or five kind of introductory slides, just to cover some of the, uh, some of the big picture kind of aspects. And uh, then I'll uh, get Ableton open, and I'll go through my project with you. Um, you can see I don't have a controller or anything. I'm not here to do like a live performance or um, or make anything on the fly, unless of course you want me to make something. But uh, I'm going to just go through the track that's kind of already made, and I'll explain uh, you know some of the techniques I've used and why I use them and so on. Okay, um, so I just wanted to talk about. The kind of big picture. Um, this is a pic this is a photograph from the How Weird Festival in San Francisco uh, a couple of weeks ago during my set. Um, some of you might recognise yourself in the photo. Uh, <laughs> you know, nothing brings people together like music. You know, um, uh, it really is. Uh, you know, a, a, a service to humanity. I think. You know, um, when people make music and it brings us all together and puts people on the dance floor and gives us kind of shared consciousness, a shared emotion. And for that time during the festival or the club, you know, everyone's kind of family, brothers and sisters. Um, that's the kind of ideal, you know, the, the, the kind of ideal circumstances that um, when we have raves and so on. And uh, I, you know, as someone who was coming from, you know, a perspective of science uh, and with a PhD, there was a lot of options available to me. You know, I could have a banker or a teacher or a lecturer or you know all these kind of things but um you know i just n none of it really uh, appealed to me you know and it's also specializing in quantum physics when i was looking for jobs uh, particularly relating to quantum physics it was all military you know military applications and i was always a bit of an idealist i wanted to you know m you know ch help change the world for the better and uh uh uh, in my view, like the military doesn't really do that. <laughs> so um, uh, I, you know, so I was a bit lost. I went in IT. I, I you know, I, I, I was kind of lost for five years, and I gradually <clears throat> convinced myself that music was worth pursuing and worth taking a risk for. Um, so I have a few quotes there from Terence McKenna, uh, one that I always like, which says, "As an artist, we must cast our nets into the ocean of mind and try to bring back a new idea." And uh, another one there which says, art's task is to save the soul of mankind. Um, I've said here, uh, music is a way of liberation. Um, this was a term that I heard 
uh, that's come from the East and is often used to describe things such as meditation and uh, yoga and kung fu and things like this. And we don't really have a term for it in the West, uh, although someone's you know someone's called it a way of liberation. But when you you know what, I've I've pursued music and it's actually kind of freed me from you know the constraints that uh, I had when I was when I was working and uh, the limitations and I've been free to travel uh, I do what I love on a daily basis I'm at home with my wife and my daughter most of you know most of the time most of the year during the weeks um, I get to travel I get to meet new people I get to go to beautiful locations like the symbiosis festival last weekend which was just stunningly beautiful in Pyramid Lake in Nevada um, and really that's all just come from me deciding to make music, uh, put, to put my energy into making music. So I'd highly recommend making music uh, for a living uh, because it leads you, uh, you never know where it's going to lead you, but you know, I think if you make music which is true to your heart, it will lead you exactly where you need to be. Um, so I, I, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, as I say, like music is, is kind of unifying, it brings people together. Uh, I think it's also healing, you know, and uh, I'm not talking about, you know, that you can just put on a track and suddenly your uh, your disease will go away. But um, uh, listening to music can be kind of inspirational in, in a way that uh, affects the choices that you make subsequent to hearing that piece of music. And uh, I had, you know, I was at a gig once and I had a kid come up to me and uh, he was just like showering me with gratitude saying that like I'd saved his life on a number of occasions because he was like so depressed and strung out and everything. And then he'd like listen to like some, some of my tracks and it just made him feel so much better. And, you know, he went and did stuff. And it, it really made me think, you know, music can be healing in the sense that it can uh, inspire us to make better choices in life uh, and so on. And um, another thing is like, it, you know, it can be ecstatic. You know, you see people on the dance floor having just the most insanely good time they've ever had in their lives, just going absolutely wild. And, I don't know really any other circumstances in which people uh, behave in that way. Um, it's obviously inspirational. Um, you know, it, it kind of uh, inspires us to, uh, you know, to be creative ourselves. Um, you know, it can be enlightening. Um, you can have moments on the dance floor when, you know, everything just kind of comes together and you, you get real kind of insight into your own life um, and your, your kind of priorities and your goals and so on. Um, and uh, it, you know, it transcends language, you know. Um, I mean, I've, you know, doing this today, I've been pretty nervous all day. I'm still pretty nervous now. And if I can get up in front of 10,000 people and play a DJ set and uh, actually hardly have any nerves at all. And it's because my music says more than I can say in words, you know. So I'm nervous because I have to put everything I want to tell you into words. Whereas I say it's much easier for me to just put it into music and play the music to you, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it you know it can evolve consciousness. You know, it can change our sense of uh, what's what's possible and what's impossible, what's real. Um, you know, it can really uh, really expand your mind. So, <clears throat> psychedelic tech funk, what is it? Well, the word psychedelic literally means soul manifesting, um, meaning it you know, comes from the soul. It's kind of a way of externalizing your soul. Tech, obviously technical, techno, technological. And funk, it's that funky and groovy. So usually tracks are around you know, 125 to 140 BPM. Uh, very kind of like abstract sounds. Uh, you want kind of hypnotic grooves, you want it to be progressive, so, you know, a, a big range of <clears throat> emotion from, like, the, the drop right through to the, the, the breakdown, you know, like, things to, like, build up and go in surprising directions. Um, it's very much layered. Uh, I tend not to use sort of so much, like, one-bar repeating loops and so on. I like to put, like, little stabs and different layers and different textures, which kind of bounce off each other and interact with each other in uh, interesting ways. So you can listen to it over and over again and hear different relationships in the music that um, you may not have heard the first time. 
Um, it's kind of like clean and spacious production. You know, I'm not going for something which is really aggressive and dirty. Um, I like it to be, you know, like to have lots of space. Um, ego dissolving. Uh, that's kind of, you know, I, t t in my creative process, I have to really kind of like leave my, my ego out of it because the ego gets in the way and kind of holds me back. And at the same time, when, when people are listening to it, I want them to be free from their own ego and their own worries and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, in the listening process and uh, really just, uh, you know, for them to just really let go and just, you know, feel, you know, feel their hearts. Um, and, you know, it's not, you know, I don't have vocals. I'm not singing about, you know, uh, recent breakups or whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's got, it's, ego is out of it. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, kind of trippy as well. <clears throat> so, um, as I say, like, before I did physics, um, I, I kind of, like, left that behind and then kind of pursued music and just really just forgot about physics. Um, but in recent times, it's kind of all been just coming back to me uh, in, you know, certain circumstances, like, lots of, like, information that I learned years ago starts coming back, and I'm starting to kind of relate it all to music. Um, and uh, I'm kind of, you know, I have a, a kind of interest in um, uh, vi vibration within the universe. So I've said here, all is vibration. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced of this now. And I, I, this is something that I understand more and more uh, kind of like every day. Um, when, when studying physics, you know, all the kind of equations and the, the ways that we describe atoms and molecules and, uh, you know, planets and stars and, uh, everything really um, use uh, vibrational equations or uh, oscillatory equations, uh, as they're sometimes called. Uh, and you know those equations are just the basic waveforms that you you see in your synthesizers. Um, uh, they're you know they're they're probably more complicated than the ones that are put into the synthesizers. But the basic forms involved are you know sine waves and saw waves and uh, you know concepts such as harmony. Uh, is very important in physics and very prominent in nature. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that <clears throat> all the frequencies in the universe uh, are, even the ones outside the range of human hearing, can actually be expressed in music uh, by, by the power of the octave. Because if you, if you have a, a frequency which is way outside the range of human hearing, you can multiply it up by octaves to get it within the range. So basically, everything in the universe can be expressed through music. Um, I'm convinced of this now, and I've, I've got I've got some. I'll show you some stuff later that uh, that you might find interesting about this. Um, <clears throat> take for example the solar system. Uh, you know, every every body in the solar system has uh, uh, an orbital frequency, so the frequency with which it goes around the sun. It also has a spinning frequency, so it's uh, spinning on its axis, like the Earth. You know, the the, the day of the Earth. Um, and there are many more frequencies, you know, that you could find uh, that are all like publicly available. For example, like Saturn and Jupiter have these different bands, and each of the different bands move at different frequencies and so on. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of intrigued as to, you know, what might happen if you take those frequencies and uh, make them into musical tones and start putting them in music. And I haven't done this myself yet, but I just wanted to throw that out there in case, you know, anybody's interested in doing anything like that. It's, Probably not actually that difficult, and it could be quite interesting to hear the objects of the solar system in a piece of music. Um, in fact, I learned just a few weeks ago that the word universe actually means one song. Uh, uni, obviously, is one, and verse is song. So, um, yeah, so, you know, there's, it's quite, I think it's quite a romantic idea. Um, but it certainly seems that through music, you can express way more than you can through, uh, through words. So I'll, I'll stop the slideshow here and uh, get Ableton open. Um, and I'll start talking through this track. <clears throat> Please feel free to jump in with any questions at any time. Um, I'm just going to talk through this kind of track by track. <coughs> and uh, uh, hopefully it will trigger some uh, uh, principles and ideas that I use in my music and, and help you with yours. So, yeah. I don't know if any of you use Ableton. Um, you know, 
uh, I didn't really intend for this to be like specifically like a how to use Ableton workshop. I wanted to focus on general uh, ideas and principles which you can you know you can use uh, whatever whatever it is you're using to make music. So usually um, to keep things tidy, um, I'll group group all my tracks together into like four or five groups. Uh, I've got here drums, percussion, bass, synths, and pads. Uh, so I'm going to start with the drums and show, well, maybe I'll just start by playing the track for you. How about that? <laughs> okay.
not quite finished track, but um, there's plenty of layers in it and uh, plenty for me to talk about. So, um, as I say, it's quite different to anything I've done before. Uh, firstly, because it has a triplet groove, which is you know still pretty experimental for me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I kind of yeah, it's you know, it's basically very experimental and different from my normal kind of groove. Um, I hope I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, so I'm going to go through it bit by bit now and um, kind of uh, tell you about some of the techniques I used. So just, you know, just a comment on workflow, uh, first of all. Um, so for years, I've been starting my tracks with drums. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I would spend hours just like working on a kick drum and a snare drum and just getting lost and frustrated and... You know, it's. Uh, I think you know. Probably some of you are aware that that's probably not the best way to start start a track, but it's actually very, very common that people start tracks that way. Um, recently, however, I've been trying to start tracks with uh, like melody, and uh, this uh, actually this sound um, that you hear at the start. Uh, which isn't playing for some reason. sound yeah so that was actually the first sound I created um, and I find it much easier starting with melody um, in the last few tracks I've made I've started with a kind of melodic component like that and I've like added more kind of uh, melodic layers um, and I've tried to build up kind of like a 16 bar loop which uh, uh, doesn't have any drums or bass line in it, so it's it's kind of uh, you know I might have something you know doing the metronome like a ride cymbal or something, just to keep the rhythm. But I'll try to build up as full uh, a loop as I possibly can with uh, lots of layers before I even touch the the beat and the bass line. So then uh, when it comes to then making the groove, um, I've got lots of material which I can you know chop up and put into the groove uh, to make it nice and colorful. So, <clears throat> okay, so I'll start with the drums. Um, this is like, drums are the one thing, like most of the music I get sent, the one thing that kind of lets it down is, is the drums. Um, usually it's kind of like just not punchy enough or the kick and the snare just aren't really gelling very well together in the mix or the you know, when the when the track starts to get like busy and hectic, the, the kick or the snare gets kind of like buried in the mix. Um, so uh, hopefully, I'll try to uh, uh, tell you some of the techniques I use. So you can see I've got quite a lot of uh, tracks here um, in the drum group. Okay, so the first thing I've got here. Uh, this SC channel is uh, a sidechain channel. I just have a sample of uh, my kick drum in there, which is triggering, but it's not producing any audio. And uh, any uh, um, sounds which I want to uh, kind of breathe with the rhythm, uh, I trigger from uh, this, this sidechain channel. And one thing I've done here, um, if you look over here, this is the track delay. So I've pulled it back by seven milliseconds which means that the side chain is triggering just seven milliseconds before the, uh, the beat actually hits. And uh, I kind of, I quite like doing this. It gives a kind of breathing effect. So rather than triggering it with your actual drums, um, you know, you're triggering with something which is silent that comes in just before the drums hit. So the sound's kind of dipped down. Uh, did we lose sound here? Yeah. yeah. Is, is it still powered on? Uh, yeah. The back yeah we're back okay so yeah the side chain very important um, uh, I've used the kick drum in this instance but I've spoken to people who will use like a like a white noise um, because uh, with white noise you can really control the shape of the envelope very well um, whereas a kick drum kind of you know usually has like a click at the start and stuff um, I just use a kick drum in this case um, 
you know, uh, as it was working fine, I used the I used the compressor to uh, control the attack uh, of, of the compression. So uh, I recommend as a you know for getting your drums punchy, you know, putting sidechain compressing uh, sidechain compression on uh, a lot of your groups and a lot of your sounds just to keep those drums punching through the mix because you know it really does make a difference on the dance floor. Um, it keeps people, you know, it keeps people dancing and uh, the, the, the tr keeps the energy of the track going. So, okay, so the first thing I've got here is my, my main kind of kick drum, <clears throat> uh, which is a nice, it's got a nice little click at the start. Um, I used the... Uh, uh, a uh, plugin called Bassism to make that. It's uh, uh, I th as far as I know, it's only available on the PC, um, but it's basically a kick drum synth. Uh, essentially, it's quite simple how it works. It creates a, a sine wave tone, which uh, goes from a high frequency to a low frequency very fast. Um, and you select the high frequency that you want to start on and the low frequency where you want to end up and how fast that envelope goes. So a kick, a kick drum is basically a zap, you know, high to low very quickly. Um, so I, I, I find that bassism to be really fat and uh, reliable and you can get a lot of different kick drum sounds out of it. Of course, I'm not content with just that though. Um, I'm kind of layering other sounds as well. So I have these kick hits, which I'm using. And another one here. Um, so when I play these together, So those other those those kick hits they kind of give uh, uh, you know kind of texture um, to the kick, um, and I've put those I've called them kick hits, but I've actually put them uh, layered with the snare snare drum as well. So I'll just show you how I constructed the snare drum. So first of all, I used bassism to create a kind of uh, a low frequency punch, which is kind of higher than the kick drum, um, but still really quite low, and. I've used the combination of like hi hats and claps and snaps layered over the top of this um, to produce the the final kind of snare sound. So if I just <clears throat> if I just solo these, bunch of claps and so on. Okay. Um, so one of the things that's like worth keeping in mind, if you're making music which is kind of like kick, snare, kick, snare, um, as I said, like a lot of the stuff I get sent, the, the, the kick and the snare just don't kind of work very well together because a lot of people, when they're starting out, they, they, they just, you know, browse a sample library for a kick drum that they like and then browse, browse it for a snare drum that they like and just put, put them in. But um, to get your kick and snare gelling together, you need to have like common elements, you know, common frequencies, which are in both the kick hit and the snare hit. Um, and one way to do that is to use hi hats. So you know, I have I have a few different hi hat tracks here, like this one, which is hitting on both the kick and the snare. Um, uh, I have uh, these kick hits. So there's quite a few different kind of common elements. Uh, in both the kick and the snare, which helps it to gel together. And like other elements that you can you can do to give give that common factor is things like put the same the same reverb uh, on both the kick and the snare, or uh, the same compression, uh, or any kind of same kind of processing or layers which are in both the kick and the snare. Uh, like a rim shot's quite good as well because um, the rim shot's got you know it's really it's really punchy. It's it's kind of quite low. Um, if you get it quite quiet in the mix and layer it on the snare and the kick, it can really help them to like you know punch really well. You know, this isn't such a problem when you're making four at the floor music, of course, because you've got that kick drum on every beat, which is giving you that consistent uh, kind of punch. Um, but the, you know, layering these elements like this, I find to be like really important in uh, getting a kind of fat punchy beat. So. One thing I did, which I haven't really done before um, in this track, is uh, I left out the second kick uh, in the bar. So usually the music I make is, as I say, kick, snare, kick, snare. But with this, it was kick, snare, space, snare um, to begin with. And then I changed the beat structure as I go later. OK. 
Okay. So, yeah, so these are just, uh, as I say, hi-hats. I've got like a white noise hit here, which, uh, you know, just a white noise on the snare drum. Very simple, but um, it just helps, you know, give the snare kind of some, you know, some presence and some color. Um, I've got uh, another hi-hat here. Again, just kind of adding to the snare drum. And then I've got some finger snaps. All in all. Oh, and a few claps as well. And that, that other claps are only happening on the second snare in the bar. Um, so there's, you know, so there's a bit of difference between the first and the second snare drum uh, in the bar. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, has anyone got any questions on drums uh, before I move on to some of the other groups? Uh, yeah. I'm a beginner. Okay. Have any MIDI in this thing, right? You don't use MIDI. Uh, there are there are some MIDI tracks. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, these are these are all these are all audio. Um, but I can, uh, you know, it's I, sometimes I'll just load a, a drum sample into a sampler and then trigger it with MIDI. Um, or sometimes I'll just pull pull the sample onto uh, you know onto the track and do it that way. Um, there are kind of pros and cons to both both methods. Um, um, yeah, I mean I'm you know I have I have MIDI tracks like a lot of my you know uh, the bass stuff and the synths are actually using like MIDI triggering software instruments. Oh, all these drums. Um, yeah, I mean, most of these, well, as I say, the kick drum, the main kick drum was uh, generated by a kick drum synthesizer. Uh, you know, the hi-hats and, uh, you know, claps and things were taken from sample libraries, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I think, I don't think there's too much to s more to say about, uh, oh, yeah, so, uh, as well as, you know, to get, as I say, to get the, this kind of common factor in the kick and the snare, I'm using uh, a technique called parallel compression, um, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, if, if not, just, just shout. Um, but basically, I have a, I have a return channel, which uh, has uh, Ableton's multiband compressor on it. Um, and I'm sending the kick drum here to, to that multiband compression. And I'm also sending the snare drum as well by about the same amount. <clears throat> and uh, this gives, uh, if I put you here, I'll just turn it on and off. It's quite subtle. It doesn't have to be too strong, but it just gives that kind of, you know, an extra bit of uh, punch. So that's it with it on. I turn it off. It sounds exactly the same. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know how it sounds to you guys, but where I'm sitting is extremely bass heavy. Um, uh, so it doesn't sound quite how it sounded in the studio when I was making it. But, uh, but basically, it's giving it a little bit of extra punch. Uh, I can maybe solo the, solo the compression channel. That might be better. You know, it's just, just a little bit, you know. Um, I think it's, you know, I like to, when I'm, when I'm modifying a sound, I like to do it really carefully and slowly, gradually bring it in. Um, and, uh, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm not always like, you know, just driving things really hard. Sometimes I just give it a little bit just to, you know, uh, give it a slight improvement. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, I haven't actually used a snare drum sample here, um, which is quite unusual. Often I'll, you know, get a bunch of snare drum samples and layer them together. Um, as I say, with this one, I used basically a kick drum sample uh, with, you know, hi-hats, claps, uh, and snaps, and white noise. Uh, so several layers just, like, added together to, to kind of make the snare drum. Um, you know, quite often, it's snare drums are, can be a bit harsh in, you know, some of the tracks I get sent. And, uh, I, 
you know, I like to be pretty careful with the snare drum because, you know, you, you're, you are going to hear it about, like, a hundred times over the course of the track. So, you know, you, you, want, you want to get it right. I mean, it's a, you know, snare drum's kind of like a full spectrum punch, you know. It, it goes from, you know, probably down at, like, you know, 100 hertz or below 100 hertz, you know, up to, you know, uh, you know, pretty much the range of human hearing. It's just a full spectrum punch. So how that's kind of shaped and how it's structured, um, you know, I usually spend quite a lot of time spend quite a lot of time on that um, <clears throat> so you see I've got some other track delays as well uh, this one here like is like back by like uh, minus one millisecond minus two milliseconds uh, it's really good to experiment with track delays when you're layering drum hits together because uh, uh, it kind of gives you know it gives structure I mean obviously every kind of drum sample has a slightly different attack uh, you know and may have yeah it may have like a little gap before it or uh, you know, this, you know, they're all different. But when you're layering them together, that's one thing I'll do is I'll experiment with the attack time of the drum, and I'll also experiment with the uh, track delay, moving things back and forward, and of course the volume, the relative volume in the layer. I'll look at all those different kind of uh, dimensions of the sound um, and move them around until, you know, until something feels right. Okay. Um, yeah, so... I think that's, you know, that's pretty much how I constructed the drums. Um, yeah. Um, so I've, uh, in terms of like the drum pattern, uh, I've used three different patterns throughout the track. Um, uh, this first one, as I say, I left out the second kick drum in the bar, um, and then. Midway into the track, I switched it up and I've dropped that kick drum in. So, uh, gone into that kind of. And uh, later in the track, when it drops, uh, it just drops into a kind of port of the floor. Um, given it kind of like three distinct kind of uh, sort of like energies in the track. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so um, I noticed that everything here sits kind of very cleanly in its own place in the whole drum uh, realm kind of here. So I was just curious, are you, are you EQing every single one of these sounds separately inside Ableton or is that something that you do when you're building the sounds uh, in your separate plugins, or are you not EQing all these separately at all? Um, yeah, I've uh, some of them are EQed. Um, or like how much EQing do you think is necessary to achieve this clean of a sound? I find that I really kind of nerd out on EQing and waste. I take yeah. a lot of time on it, and I'll come back hours later and be like, "This I don't think sounds that much different than hours yeah. ago when I started this." <laughs> well, I mean, what, what I'd say about EQing. Um, there's a few kind of like golden rules I have with it. Um, you know, the first one, I guess, you know, most people are, are aware of, which is to obviously cut the low frequencies out of all your sounds except, uh, you know, the kick, the kick drum and the bass or, uh, or the snare or, you know, the, the main kind of low frequency sounds in the track. Everything else is worth just cut, cutting out. And, you know, I, you don't have to be too fussy with it, you know, just, just get, you know, cut the lows and drag it up and it sounds okay. But like one thing that people don't do quite so much uh, in my experience is is cut the highs, um, and I've been doing this a lot recently. Um, you know, you can when when you're up at like sort of like twelve, you know, twelve to twenty kilohertz, um, a lot of sounds you can you can cut that you can cut that out without really losing much of the character of the sound. You know, I mean, you will you know the, the, there is obviously some loss, but and the reason the reason I like to do this is because. When you get to kind of like later in the track, where you want to move up the energy of the track, uh, and you want to put like in some like ride cymbals or um, you know shakers or something really kind of airy and and, and bright, um, then that that kind of stuff. If you EQ, make sure you take the highs out of anything that doesn't need the highs as you go. Then when it comes to later in the track and you are putting in sounds like that, then they just slot in the mix like really easily. Um, I used to because. I was, Years ago, I didn't have very good speakers. I used to like boost the highs a lot, um, and because I wanted that kind of like bright, you know, that kind of bright buzzy sound in in my tracks. Um, 
But then, yeah, I would always wonder why things like ride symbols and stuff just never seem to sit in the mix. And, uh, you know, and really th that was why. And um, on my recent tracks where I've been actually like, you know, quite brutally cutting the highs on loads of sounds as I've been producing, the tracks, I, when, once the mix down's complete and it's been mastered, actually sound way brighter than uh, a lot of my other tracks. Um, and it's just kind of, if you've got a sound, if you've got a sound which doesn't fit in your mix pretty well, I just say cut the lows, cut the highs, you know, just put a band pass on it and then play with the volume and you should find, you, you should find a sweet spot pretty easily. You know, in terms of getting like really kind of, uh, you know, cutting, cutting the mids and looking for specific tones and frequencies, I mean, that's, you know, something you, you got to do on a kind of per, per sound basis. But um, really, that's my kind of golden rule, cut, cut the lows, cut the highs and uh, play, play with the volume and, you know, you should, you should manage to get it to sit in the mix, okay? Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to confirm, you are low cutting a lot of the other stuff that's not the kick drum, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. There will be low cuts throughout that. I mean, uh, not everything, you know, I mean, like, we've got these, like, claps and things. They, they don't have any low cut on them at the moment. Uh, other snaps. That don't have any prominence really low down in yeah. 200 or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, are you uh, going to go over some of those effects, too? I heard, like, an awesome sweep in the beginning. Oh, sure, yeah. Whenever you um, get to it, I just want to see if you were going to do that. Yeah, unfortunately, I, like, my, uh, my PC, I use a PC to uh, make, make my music, and uh, some of the synths I use are not available on Mac, uh, and so some of the sounds I just had to, like, bounce down to audio, but I'll try to explain as best I can how I made them. Uh, it's not too many, though. I, I tried to use a lot of Ableton built-in stuff as much as I could, but um, there are just a few of my favorite synths um, that uh, aren't yet available on Mac. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, other than just obviously, uh, you know, panning it, there is uh, something called uh, the, the Haas effect, I think it's called, um, where you... you Basically, use a delay to um, create, uh, like a stereo delay to create, um, uh, yeah, a delay between the left channel and the right channel, and it creates this kind of width. And you can experiment, you know, just like a few milliseconds. Like, you know, the left channel could be delayed by say three milliseconds, and the right channel by five. Um, and just playing with those different values, you can spread things out really nicely and uh, make them nice and wide. Yeah. That's something I do quite a lot. Was bouncing in the build-up. It seemed like the kick, the kick drum was bouncing left and right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, was that? Oh yeah, so yeah. That's uh, yeah. One of these, one of the snare drums is going left and right. There's there's a central one, and then there's another one which is layered over it, which is going left and right. Yeah, well spotted. <laughs> Anyone else? No. Okay. Um, right. So. What we got next? We have uh, the percussion group. So let's have a look. Okay, so the first thing I've got in the in the first build up here, um, I've got uh, uh, just a kind of filter filter beat using Ableton's auto filter. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's you know kind of like any other filter. Um, uh, it's got low pass, high pass, band pass, and so on. It also has uh, uh, you can also modulate the uh, modulate the cutoff point. I'll have a bandpass um, filter on it. I've got the amount up. So what's actually happening here is uh, it has uh, it modulates the left and the right separately. So I'll play the I'll play the track to illustrate what I mean. So there's uh, an amount control here, which obviously says how much the how much it sweeps up and down the frequency spectrum. Uh, there's a rate control, which is set to four bars, 
so it's going over four bars. And then this phase control here uh, basically determines the difference in phase between the left and the right channels. I'm not actually getting stereo where I'm sitting. I think that speaker isn't working. But uh, um, I don't know if, if you can hear that there's you know a difference in the sweeping between the left and the right channel. And that was just, uh, I just used a sample, just one of the, uh, one of the vengeance samples there. Um, I, you know, I don't use, I don't use samples for kind of like the main, uh, main elements of my tracks, but, you know, I sometimes use it for kind of like support, supporting elements, you know. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, what else have we got? So, I've got a track for some drum fills. Um, a few little things like this. Uh, which and some other uh, um, yeah. So I'll show you how I did this. Uh, you can hear like on that that little hit there. It kind of it kind of uh, purrs almost. That's using uh, just basically time stretching. I got a loop, and uh, this hit here, I've stretched out to be twice the length um, that, that, that it was in the original loop. So the original loop was something like this. Just stretched it out. Just kind of suspends it, you know, for a little bit longer and gives it a kind of graininess. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought it sounded quite good. Um, <clears throat> Some other uh, other drum fills. So I just for these I was just getting basically percussion loops and using uh, Ableton's warping here, which uh, lets you basically get handle on each of the transient points in the loop and then move them to wherever you want and stretch them and make them as long as you want. Um, there's a really cool feature actually, um, which I'll show you. Uh, if you're into Ableton or if you're not, this might inspire you to get into it. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to just move this along. I'll move these out of the way. I'll take this big one here. And I'm going to stretch it out really far. Um, this little thing here where it says beats and then it says preserve transients. You can, uh, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't do triplets, but uh, <laughs> it does do. Uh, uh, you know the other um, straight divisions, but basically it time stretches the track, but it preserves the transients rhythmically. So, uh, if you imagine for the moment, I'm not making a triplet tune. That's not doesn't sound too good, but let's try this. So this changes the envelope of mine. If I take this down, it's perhaps not the best sample to demonstrate this with, but I'll show you it with another sample. It's really cool. It, it'll kind of, it'll, it'll stretch it rhythmically, um, which can, you know, if you're doing it with like synth noises or vocals, things like that, it's a really cool effect. Um, so let me just uh, undo what I did there. And I have some bigger drum fills here, which this is just sampled from like a classic sort of 70s funk track. But I've kind of, again, I've taken the, I've gotten a handle on all the transients and uh, just kind of moved them around to, uh, uh, you know, the, the original track that I sampled from wasn't in triplets, but I was able to, you know, get into triplets quite easily just by dragging them and setting the grid on Ableton to eight triplets. Um, and, uh, yeah, just dragging it where I want them to go. A little bit of reverb on the end there. Okay. <clears throat> um, the next thing I have in here is uh, this is kind of a I've got here. It's called combed noise. Um, it's just in audio at the moment, but basically it's just white noise hits going through a comb filter to give it uh, some texture. So. Uh, 
Um, again, it's quite subtle in the mix, but. Um, and I've got another thing here, which is just a little noise sweep. Um, <clears throat> I have it going through um, an EQ, which is uh, shaped to produce kind of uh, an A uh, vowel, like an R. Um, it's quite subtle, um, but it pushes things along quite nicely. If I take the EQ off, that's how it sounds normally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you'll notice like a lot of, you know, a lot of what I've got here is actually like really kind of like small sounds and that's just kind of the way I like to work, you know, just kind of like getting lots of little bits and uh, getting them kind of sounding good on their own and, and then like filling the gaps in one track with another track and then just seeing how they all start to like bounce off each other. <clears throat> so this track here is kind of like glitchy percussion. Um, I... I basically got, um, again, just a kind of like rhythmic loop. Um, and then I started like slicing it up into its components and like stretching them and like placing them in the grid in different places. So if I just, if I just saw this. Uh, it starts to get a bit more interesting. So, I mean, on its own, it doesn't sound great, but it's really rhythmical with everything else. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, really... Uh, you know, kind of like microbeat style, you know, the, the, the time stretching and uh, like looping gives it that kind of, uh, that kind of buzzy texture. Um, and I'm just kind of using it to uh, emphasize certain hits and certain spaces in the groove. So, okay, moving on, I've got this, uh, another track here, which I've called Bit Hits. Um, again, this is kind of like a microbeat, microbeat kind of style. Uh, it's panning. You can see I've pulled down the highs and the lows on this one. Um, and it's actually transposed up by 18 semitones from the original sample. So if I, you know, I'll let you hear, if I take the EQ off, and take it back down to zero. You know, that, that was the original sound. Back up to 18, the EQ on. Um, and also, at this point in the drop, I've, uh, I've got some reverb automation. So this, this little box here is uh, like how much um, uh, I'm sending to the, uh, the re this reverb here. So I've turned it all the way up full for the first hit. And uh, because it's right on a drop, it's just given it a little <laughs> to uh, push it along. Um, okay. Um, I've also got some ride symbols. Uh, which I've used in the intro and then uh, some of the, you know, in the middle, middle of the track. So, <clears throat> basically I've just got, I've got a whole bunch of ride cymbal samples here, um, which uh, uh, were from the, from the battery kits. Um, it's just basically all the cymbals, from, uh, all the ride cymbals from the battery kits. Um, I've got it going through a ping pong delay, uh, just to give it a bit of uh, spatial Turn that off. Just gives it a bit of space. I've cut all the lows out of it. 
Um, I've also got it going through a multiband compressor. Which if I take that off, see that's made quite a difference. So essentially, I'm boosting the, uh, I'm compressing the the top layer of frequencies here. So everything above 2.5 kilohertz, um, and I've kind of taken down some of the mids. And I'll show you this little tool here. It's really cool. It's relatively cheap plugin. I think it's only about forty dollars or something. Um, it's called LFO Tool, and it basically lets you to it lets you draw in uh, any kind of shape LFO curve you can imagine. Um, and then you can assign it to uh, frequency cutoff. Uh, it's got its own filter built in here, a low pass, a band pass, and a high pass. Uh, you can assign it to the resonance, and you can assign it to the volume uh, or the pan. And uh, <clears throat> I think one way to, uh, when, you're, you know, when you're making music kind of, you know, like the way, the way I am, you know, you're not, you're not playing the instruments, you know, I'm not, I'm not classically trained or anything. But I like to try and get that kind of human feel in things if I can. Um, and so what I've done here is I've drawn in this volume envelope and uh, using this little setting here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, plus with modulation, if you, watch, uh, if you watch how the LFO plays and listen, uh, you'll see it has a kind of whipping effect. It kind of it gets faster as it gets towards the end of the uh, wave. You know, giving it a kind of, you know, if I take it right down. There's that kind of like whipping motion towards the end. So the blue shadow that you see there is actually the uh, what's happening after the pulse width. If I, if I bring this down again, you can see how the shape kind of changes. Um, and you can mess with like the phase and the timing of all this. I've got the, so, so this is like a one bar kind of loop length here. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it gives it, you know, it kind of sounds a little bit like a real drummer, you know. You know just easing off in the middle there. I like to use that a lot, you know. Um, uh, those kind of subtle volume envelopes uh, really helps to give, you know, movement and, uh, and breath to things. <clears throat> okay, um, I got some bongos. Again, I was just using samples and just getting them into uh, uh, the triplet time uh, time grid. Um, I've cut the highs and the lows out of the bongos, I get them to sit in the mix. Um, and I'm using a gate here because there's actually quite a lot of noise in the background of this loop. Um, it was like, I don't know, it's like people talking and stuff, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I put the gate on. And it's just kind of got the noise uh, noise out of there. Um, cool. Uh, this other sound I made in a synth, which is PC only. Um, it's called Diversion. It's one of my favorite synths. Uh, really, really cool. Um, uh, very powerful. I, w I wish I could show you around it, but um, I, you know, I, I can't get on my laptop at this stage. But yeah, I made this sound using uh, just saw waves. And uh, one of the things I like about diversion is that for each of the oscillators, um, there are a whole bunch of parameters that you can modulate, which change the shape of the waveform. So you know, without even without even touching, you know, filters or effects, you're able to like you know very quickly and precisely change the shape of the waveform, and and uh, you know it produces some nice uh, nice effects. So. Quite cool sound. Yeah. Uh, so I've just kind of yeah called that kind of croaky percussion, um, and. Yeah, I just have a bit of compression on that, just to uh, you know bring it out in the mix a bit more. Uh, this next one here, um, I can show you this this uh, this thing here, this beat repeat street. I'll show you how I made this. Um, but basically, this is just again kind of like a nice kind of like micro beat thing.
It's actually changing all the time um, because of uh, because of this little thing here. And I'll show you how I made that. Um, but we don't even mind if we just took a five minute break just for the toilet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Been drinking rather a lot of water. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, so you can do that here. You can't really do that during during a DJ set. Just kind of stop the music and say you're going to the toilet. But uh, <laughs> okay, um, right. So yeah, I've got this little custom instrument that uh, I made, um, which I've got on this glitch bits thing, uh, which is pretty cool for uh, you know introducing a bit of randomness, um, keep things changing. I've called it. Beat Repeat Street. It's, I mean, are many people familiar with Ableton's Beat Repeat plugin? No? No one? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, basically, what I've done here is uh, I've, Ableton has this cool rack feature where you can, uh, you can get a whole load of plugins, chain them together, and then you can take different parameters from each of those plugins and assign them to uh, one or more of these eight macro controls. Um, so like, uh, <clears throat> let's start. So yeah, so one of the controls I've got here is low cut. Uh, that, that basically just controls this uh, cutoff point in the EQ. So um, I can, you know, I've got this saved, isn't it? so I can put this onto any, I can put this onto any track I want, and I can cut the lows out of it straight away. Um, so the next uh, effect I have in the chain is uh, erosion, which uh, introduces uh, uh, kind of white noise at a particular frequency. So you can see here I've got erosion amount and erosion frequency. Um, so if I solo that. You know, the best sound to hear that on, but Just adds a bit of dirt and uh, a bit of kind of grittiness to the sound. Um, the next effect I've got in here is uh, Ableton's simple delay, which is, uh, as, it, as it says on the tin, as is the simple delay. There's no filtering or anything. Um, <coughs> and uh, I have this assigned to, uh, let's see. Yeah, I have this assigned to this here, which I've called drops. So. If I turn this up, sounds like insects having a party or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's basically that. What that single knob is controlling the feedback of the delay. The dry wet amount of the delay and the time of the delay. So when the knob's at zero, the uh, the delay time is at one millisecond and the dry wet's all the way dry, so you're not hearing it at all. And you've watched as I turn it up. Um, and this, uh, the simple delay actually has three modes. If you right click on the top here, you got this repitch, fade, and jump. It's set to repitch mode, which is why you're hearing uh, the pitches of the delayed notes changing. Uh, if I set it to fade, for example, it would sound a bit different. And uh, if I set it to jump, it would sound different again. Um, you know, I like I like the repitch. So yeah, really good for textures and stuff. Um, so the next effect I have in the chain is a saturator. Um, and basically, uh, I've just 
you know, that's just for you know, kind of fattening things up. I don't really need it for this sound, but. Yeah, it's good for kind of, uh, you know, just getting some saturation in there. Yeah, but then the real, you know, the real kind of like uh, magic of this is uh, I've got this beat repeat plugin. I've actually got five of them. Uh, and like what beat repeat does is it allows you to select um, a particular point in uh, a bar that it will sample the sound that comes in at that point and then loop it. Um, so on this on, on this first beat, beat repeat, um, I've got the offset set to zero, and that yellow line you can see is like right at the start um, of the of the pattern. And then you have uh, a gate, which says how long it's going to loop for after it samples it. So, and yeah, and this other thing here, this grid point, uh, this is. Uh, how, how big the, the loop length is going to be. So um, I've used one here at the start, and I've got another one which then triggers after that one, and another one here which triggers after that one, and then another one here which triggers after that one. But this one has actually got an envelope on it, so it's uh, actually decaying. And then uh, finally I've got another one here with an envelope on it. And you see they all have different grid sizes. Um, like this is... But because I'm in a triplet time signature, these are all multiples of three. So this is like a 12. This is like a 96. There's another one with a 12, a 24, um, and a 6. So if this, you know, if this is going over your head and you want me to explain, just you know, please just shout. Um, so I've the controls I have. I have these two macro controls um, control the chance parameter and the interval parameter of all those beat repeats. So the chance parameter is basically uh, the random factor. When it's set to 100%, it will grab and loop it every single time. So if I put it up to 100 and play it, it's, yeah, maybe I should play it without it first. Uh, so if I turn down to zero, And then as I start to introduce the chance, uh, it will pick up samples from different points in the loop and then re repeat them for maybe, say, two, you know, two sixteenths. Yeah, well... I think you get, I think you get the idea. Basically, it helps to introduce an element of randomness, and I find this like really handy, uh, at the, particularly in the early stages of a track. Um, you know, when you there's a you know there's a tendency to get like stuck in a loop. You know, it's one of the things you know the most common complaints of you know uh, like amateur producers and so on is that they you know they just get kind of like stuck in a loop, and it's like you know. One minute is like the best sounding thing they've ever heard, and then like three hours later they hate it, you know. Um, and a good way to, you know, keep the, you know, it's because it's it's not it's not changing, you know, a loop. I mean, there may be things changing within the loop, but then the more and more you listen to it, the more kind of stagnant it becomes, and you know, that kind of effect, you know, affects your creativity. Um, so I can throw this onto, uh, uh, you know, any any kind of sound. Um, you know, I might it might be cool to try it on something on something else that's uh, a bit more obvious. Those kind of like micro beat sounds are. Um, let's say it's a bit hard to notice what it's actually doing. Uh, if I can just copy that, let's take a sound like yeah, this intro sound here, and I'll paste. And yeah, there we go. Okay, so this should demonstrate it a bit better. So I'll turn it off. OK, so that's just a one bar loop. And I'm going to turn this on. I'll turn the chance down to 0. Uh, I'm going to turn the erosion off. Um, OK, so it still shouldn't be doing anything. And then I'll gradually turn up the chance. And you'll start to see random looping elements coming into it. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, you know, very easy to just create, like, you know, whole whole kind of different patterns, um, you know, using this. Um, so, yeah, and finally, the, the other thing um, I have here that uh, I haven't talked about yet, I've called uh, freeze delay. Um, <clears throat> that's triggering uh, basically a filter. So as I turn the knob up, the, this, uh, this, this filter will switch on. Uh, you know, it's switched off when the knob is at zero, um, but it'll switch on and it'll start sweeping up in a kind of high pass filter pa um, uh, as a high pass filter. Um, and it will control both the, the cutoff uh, and the resonance of that filter. So it gets really kind of peaky as it goes up. Like, um, oh, I can't show it just now. But it's also, um, it's also going to a ping pong delay. And it's turning up the feedback of a ping pong delay and the dry wet of uh, a ping pong delay. And this little F button here, this is freeze. Uh, that's freeze. So at any point, you can press that. And the delay will actually just freeze and repeat. So <clears throat> if I go back here and uh, I play this. And I'll show you. This is actually a really powerful effect, and it's really simple. And it's a great way to, you know, if you if you've not used macro knobs before, you know, this is a great way to start. Is to you know get one knob which controls a high pass filter and a delay uh, at the same time. It's really powerful. That's the freeze, yeah. Right at the top of the knob, I've got it freezing. It's pretty cool. Um, this button here, map mode. This uh, basically, this is all the the different knobs in this beat repeat street and the what 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 they're affecting. Um, and you can determine like the minimum and maximum value of each of the parameters that it's affecting. Um, so, for example, in the freeze delay there, you can see the actual, this one here, the freeze parameter, that only switches on when I get to 121, you know, which is like right up there, you know. Um, and it's very easy, it's, you know, very easy just to set, you know, set the map mode and set the ranges um, and you know you can get these kind of like one knob effects which are like really powerful okay so <clears throat> where are we um, and we're going through the percussion yeah so the, the glitch bits thing again you know this was like a, you know some kind of like a percussive loop that um, I got from a sample library. I mean, I should mention I also make sample CDs for a company called Sample Magic. Um, actually, that was one of the things that allowed me to make the transition from, you know, working in a proper job to uh, <laughs> becoming uh, a music full time uh, because it's a really good source of income and it also helped me to kind of hone my skills because uh, I was making sample packs for lots of different uh, genres of music. So it would afford me the chance to learn uh, the different techniques that are used in different genres of music and, uh, you know, put together a product, um, you know, using those techniques. Um, and, yeah, you know, if it's something, you know, you, you know, it's something good to supplement your income if you are a producer, um, you know, you'll probably, you know, if you want to do it, you'll probably find an opportunity somewhere, someone who will, you know, pay you to make some samples. Um, it's good fun. It helps you build up your own sample library because, not only are you obviously keeping the sample packs you've made, obviously, but um, you can also save any kind of patches and things that you make on the way, you know, in, in between. So you can build up like a really uh, good library. Um, you know, this, I think a lot of times when you sit down in front of the computer, there's a real pressure to make a track. Um, but when you're just working on sounds with no expectation of, you know, how it's going to have to fit into a track or, you know, or no pressure to actually finish a track, but you're just sitting down for a whole day making loops and making patches. You know, that's something I think a lot of people don't actually take the time to do, but um, it's well worth it. Um, and if you can get paid to do it, even better.
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, you know, as I say, I just, I just made that, and I, I've, I've got more back on my home computer. Um, uh, s uh, some other, um, actually, I might, I might have one here. Um, yeah, there's a few other ones here. Um, Xbox filter box. I can't actually remember <laughs> when I last used that, but. Um, Let's open it up and see what it does. Okay. So. Yeah, so this is just something to give me uh, I think this is quite an old one I made. As I say, I don't use my laptop for um, producing music that often. Uh, but yeah, I think I made this just to give me some nice kind of uh, tonal control over uh, sounds. Um, inside it, I've got, yeah, that's not, not a very big one. I've just got basically a low pass and a high pass. I've got resonance control on both of them. Uh, I've got an EQ and uh, an erosion, uh, just to give me some grit on it. But I mean, the possibilities are kind of like endless with this. I mean, you know, not only can you actually make a chain of effects as long as you want, but you can actually make as many chains as you want. So you can have like all these like parallel chains of effects. Um, I mean, and you can actually embed racks within racks. So you know, I can, if I right click here and I go group then it will put the rack I've just created in another rack. So I've got then a whole set of macro knobs here. And, you know, it's, you can nest it infinitely, you know, as much as your, as much as your computer can handle, really. Um, and, you know, you don't have to just use Ableton effects. I mean, you could have, like, waves effects in here or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, whatever plugins you want, you can, you can put in there. And this is really one of the most powerful features of Ableton, um, which, I, you know, I don't know if other... I mean, I, I think Reason, Reason's got something called the Combinator, which, you know, does a similar kind of thing like this. You can just, like, nest as many instruments and things as you want in there. I don't know about Logic and Cubase. I mean, I'm sure they have something similar. But, um, you know, really good for sound design and, you know, also for, like, live performance as well. <clears throat> yeah, I should say, by the way, that, um, I, you know, I'm not doing live performance at the moment. It's something I've kind of wanted to do. But, you know, I was a DJ before I was a producer, and I do love to DJ. Um, and even though I play, most of my sets I play kind of like most of my own stuff. There's like, you know, a few other artists who, who's, who sound I like to represent. But, um, you know, when I sit down in the studio, like, I just, I want to make new music. I, just, I can't be bothered going back through all my old tracks and like cutting them up and everything. It just, I don't know, it's just something I've, you know, hasn't really uh, appealed to me, you know. Uh, however, uh, on saying that, <clears throat> for the last uh, year or so, <clears throat> every time I finish a track, um, as I say, I've got these like you know these groups, um, and usually I'll have yeah sort of you know, usually about five or six groups. So sometimes we have two different synth groups. Um, uh, basically, I will bounce down each of these groups individually, so uh, so I have them like as stems. So I'll have like. Just the track, just the drums of the track, just the percussion, just the bass, and then it's very easy within within Ableton to um, cut those up and put them into the session view, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen before. You know, this is very commonly used for like live performance. You have basically you can fill this with clips, and you can like trigger the clips with your controllers and affect each of the different stems of your track individually, and. Uh, when I do get a live set together, that's how I will do it, you know, and uh, that's why I always make a point of like bouncing down those stems uh, at the end of a project. It's actually a really good thing to do for a mix down as well, you know. Um, when when you get to like this stage in the track, I mean, when I get home, this is what you know what I'll do with this track, um, you know, to actually kind of like work on the mix down, uh, you know. Particularly when you know you're getting to like words like the kind of emotional peak of the track and stuff, it can be pretty hard when you've got all these, you know, 
all these elements all over the place and you know Ableton you know as much as I love it it doesn't have much screen space and it doesn't support multi monitors you know so you're kind of like you know getting around in all these tracks and you know doing the levels and everything it can be a bit of a pain in the arse um, so I'll bounce down the five stems and then I'll just open a new project and drop in those five wave files and then you've got like a nice clean project with just five wave files you know you can still you know, all your sounds are still in there. You know, you're working with audio, you can cut those wave files, you can reverse them. You know, there's lots, lots and lots of creative possibilities as well as being like really easy to do the mix down um, because you're only mixing with five tracks. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I always do that at the end of my tracks now. And uh, it just, it's just, you know, when you, you've got all this and you just close it and you open up and you just got five tracks to work with, it's just like, ah, you know, it's just a load off. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. So, I'm a I'm a Logic guy, so everything you're doing, I'm trying to like kind of transfer in my head and how I yeah. would do it in Logic. But when you say grouping, is that bussing? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Okay, in Logic. is that yeah. is that bussing? In in Ableton. Okay. So basically, you're just doing it. Okay, percussion one bus. Yeah. Basically. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess if you haven't already, I guess if you could go deeper into more why you would do one thing one way or why you would bust something, you know, whatever your bussing techniques may be. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I mean, the the, the 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 groups, you know, I mean, I, I guess they're just chosen, you know, uh, you know, as as just sound, sound groups, really. Um, you know, unfortunately, with Ableton, you can't do groups within groups, which I'd quite I'd, I'd like if they could do that in the next version. Um, but, uh, you know, like I say, I mean, they're very broad. You know, these groups are very broad. You know, there's drums, percussion, bass, synth, um, and pad, you know, for this track. Um, and that's just, you know, I guess that, that's just uh, the way I've, I've always kind of done it, you know. Um, but, you know, once, once they're grouped together, I can then, you know, send... Uh, uh, send effects to you know to the buses. I can like process each of the buses. So, for example, I think on this on the bass bus, I've got some sidechain compression. So, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, so I've got like all these different bass lines, all these different bass sounds. They're all going to the same bus, and then I'm sidechaining the bus. You know, so that's one way of using it. But um, you know, with the others, you know, it's really just to keep things tidy. You know, some. Of the, you know, some of the other ones, it just kind of keeps things tidy. And of course, when it comes to the mix down as well, then, you know, and as I say, I'm bouncing these into uh, tracks and putting them into another project, then everything's kind of like kind of grouped logically and it just kind of makes sense. <clears throat> okay, so time is moving on and I've not even got to the baseline yet. So, uh, <laughs> or the synths or anything. So, yeah, I mean, in the rest of the percussion group, basically, I've got some uh, like air, you know, like uh, sweeping white noise. Um, that think that that's about it, really. I got some sweeping white noise, some reverse cymbals, and things like that. You know, nothing, nothing too fancy. Okay. <clears throat> so right onto the bass. So uh, I've used. Uh, I don't always make multi-part bass lines. You know, sometimes. I just have one bass synth, and if it's like well made enough and the pattern is right, it can just be like really groovy. And I've literally just got one track from a bass. But for this one, you know, I wanted to make something a bit more kind of you know like sort of like multi-part bassline style. So um, let's have a listen to it uh, soloed. Okay, so the thing, the baseline I started with was this one here that I've called the stab bass. Uh, it's in MIDI. Um, just you know, root note, eighth triplets. Um, I've got something here which I've called a bass dive, which is just something that kind of goes boo. 
um, at the end of the at the end of the bar there. Um, ooh, you heard that there, um, which just kind of leads nicely into the next drop. And <clears throat> I've got one here which I've called Liquid Bass, which uh, I made in a synth called Alchemy, which I could highly recommend. Uh, really good synth. Um, I've also recorded it into audio, um, which is what, the, what that second liquid bass track is. Uh, whoops. You know, I, I'm not actually using that last part of the bass, but I was just using it for... Um, yeah, I mean, I've got... Uh, I, you know, I mean, Alchemy is kind of a beast. I don't want to go into it really that much, but, um, you know, it's it's got a large amount of oscillators. You know, you could, this, this NOSC parameter, you can really, really thicken up sounds and get, like, really lush textures. It's got masses of uh, filter types. Um, it's got LFOs, uh, HDSR envelopes. It's got multi-segment envelopes, which is what I'm using in this case. So, if I turn that down, for example, then it won't make that weird noise at the end. Um, I, you know, as I said before, I really like these kind of like whippy envelope curves, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, you know, this is, this is a great synth, you know, check it out if you can. Um, that's what I used to make this. So... Okay. Okay, so I got another little one here, um, which unfortunately is in audio, but it was quite simple to make. I'll explain how I made it. Uh, where are we? It's really just uh, I've used uh, a few different oscillators with saw waves. Uh, all going into a low pass filter, and then I have the low pass filter opening up, um, which is obviously producing the overall shape of it. Um, and as well as having the low pass filter opening up, I've also got it going to a 12th note uh, LFO, like a triplet LFO, so it's kind of wobbling, going wah, 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 wah. Um, the, the yeah, that, that That's doing the volume, I think. And it just you know it just helps it sit in the in the groove a bit nicely you know just that little bit of modulation on it. Um, let's look at the waveform here. Yeah, so you can see, yeah, so there's volume automation happening um, in in the triplet time signature as the filter is opening up. <clears throat> and uh, I've used uh, I've also used the uh, the Haas effect that I talked about earlier here. So this filter delay plugin um, has. Uh, uh, a left channel, uh, left channel delay, a right channel delay, and a, a center, a center delay, which I've got turned off. Um, I have a delay of 16 milliseconds on the left channel and a delay of six milliseconds on the right channel. I've got the feedback turned all the way down, so it's only triggering once. Um, and if I turn that off, uh, you hear the difference. So, whoops, just so that. Put it on. Yeah, can everyone hear the difference of that? It's just, it's kind of like much wider. I can hear it quite well here. It just helps bring the bass out from the other bass sounds that are in there, you know, um, like the, 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 ones, the ones that we've talked about so far. Um, well, the first the first couple of the, the the main kind of bass sounds that are like pure down the middle kind of mono, um, the liquid bass thing here that I was talking about that's actually panning. Uh, it's got like LFO panning on it. Um, you can see it's you know the left and the right channel is kind of different there. Uh, um, and yeah, and so this one is like nice nice and wide. Uh, it's you know kind of when you're doing these kind of multi-part bass lines, you know the the key is obviously to get is you know you want I, I kind of want it all to be you know a bass, but you know I want each to be distinct in its own way. So I'm trying to create that um, that contrast between each of the different uh, 
you know, each of the different bass sounds. And uh, yeah, using like, you know, these width techniques and so on is a good way to do that. Um, uh, okay, I have another bass here, which is uh, still in MIDI, and I can show you how I made it. Um, let's have a listen. Okay, so <clears throat> this is Ableton's operator synth. Um, it's, uh, you know, I probably, I did, I had this for years and never really used it. And I must confess, it's, it, it was because, of, because I just kind of looked at the interface and thought, wow, that looks a bit shit. But actually, it's really good. Uh, you know, it looks can be deceiving, shall we say. Um, you know, obviously, it comes, you know, built in with Ableton and it's, uh, you know, just looks like everything else in Ableton. But, um, you know, it's actually a really uh, powerful synth. Uh, it's an FM synthesizer, um, meaning you can use, there's four oscillators on the left here, and you can use, uh, use these to modulate the frequencies of other oscillators and so on. Um, and in fact, that's what I'm doing here. So <clears throat> I'll talk you through this quickly. I don't know if you know much about FM synthesis, um, uh, but, you know, it's pretty easy to demonstrate with this synth. Um, Okay, so what's happening at the moment is oscillator B is modulating the pitch of oscillator A. Um, if I turn the level of uh, oscillator B down, then that modulation will stop. Okay, so uh, oscillator A is basically playing a kind of truncated saw wave. So, you know, a saw wave obviously has harmonics going all the way up, but this one actually has eight harmonics, and then it stops. So it's a very deep sound. This oscillator has a square wave on it, and as I turn it up, it starts to modulate the pitch of the oscillator A but very, very fast, which basically creates the, the tone that you hear. And this course tuning here is actually the uh, um, is the harmonic series. So, like every time you turn that, you know, it goes like all the way up to forty eight. Um, so yeah, th this is uh, you know you can get some like really crazy tones uh, just with like literally. You know these four, these four knobs, changing the waveforms, changing the levels, changing the course tuning. Uh, it's there's, there's a a really just large range of tones you can get with just a few knobs. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, so okay, so the sounds coming out of oscillator A, and then the first thing it's doing is it's going into a filter. Uh, I've just got a low pass 24 dB filter here, a um, little bit of resonance, and then I'm using an LFO to uh, modulate the filter cutoff, and I'm using a saw wave shape, like a downward saw wave shape, which is what's creating that. Um, you know, I can change that to a sine wave, or yeah, whatever, uh, square. And uh, I've got this spread control turned all the way up to 100, and that's basically just doing exactly what I just demonstrated in the uh, with the filter delay. It's just creating a small delay between the left and right channels. Um, if I turn it, if I turn it off, on. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but yeah, it's pretty clear here. Um, yeah, so uh, you know. Nothing really too technical there in, you know, in terms of just like, you know, using an LFO and, and creating that kind of shape. But, the, you know, it's re it was really getting the tone, tone of it right. Um, and that's where, you know, you can, you can spend a lot of time messing around with uh, FM oscillators. You know, I can use, for example, I've got 
these other two oscillators are switched off, but I can use them to, you know, I could I could use C to modulate B and D to modulate C and you know chain them all up. In fact, there's a whole bunch of algorithms here uh, for like different ways that the oscillators can uh, relate to each other, and um, I mean it's basically infinite. You know, there's so many different tones you can create with this. Uh, uh, it's it, it's cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so moving on, I've got a few more bass noises. Um, this one here, which is an audio which I made uh, on my PC. Um, now it sounds just like a saw wave. It's obviously based on a saw wave, but um, the the tonal character that I got with it was uh, using a, a peaking filter. So just uh, just creates a peak in the uh, in the frequency spectrum, um, you know, kind of like you would do with an EQ. Um, but I've got it moving over the course of the um, uh, moving with the envelope. What do I mean? Uh, a synth called Diversion, uh, which I believe is a Mac version uh, coming, but it was uh, PC only uh, to begin with. Highly recommend it. It's really good. Um, Okay, so I'll just play that. Okay, that's is that really loud. <laughs> that was really loud to me. Um, okay, moving on then. Um, <clears throat> I've got another bass uh, stab here, which I've also made an operator. You can see I've got different kind of settings here. You know, I'm using different waveforms. You know, there's like loads of waveforms to choose from in each of the oscillators. And of course, when you have then the oscillators modulating each other, and you've got all these different course tuning settings at different levels, it's, you know, really powerful. Um, so this is just playing like, it's doing like a little sort of pitch bend. That's it. it just kind of pushes, uh, pushes, fills a gap basically that was left by the other bass notes. Uh, and a, another one which kind of answers it here. So this one's in audio, uh, but the two of them uh, kind of work really nicely together and sound almost like one sound. Uh, Oh, uh, that was made in a synth on my PC as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they just kind of like, yeah, they, they sound like one sound, really. Um, okay, uh, I've got like a little wobble bass thing which comes in a bit later. Just, just got that triplet, that eighth note triplet. Um, comes in a bit later and just pushes things along. Uh, the two tracks here, which I'm not actually using anymore, I can delete those. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, another wobble again. This was made on my PC in audio, but um, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't make this kind of thing using some of the techniques I've already discussed. So yeah, in this case, I'm actually modulating the uh, LFO rate. So uh, it starts off really slow. It gets faster and then it comes down to kind of a mid. Yeah. Um, it's modulating the LFO rate is really powerful. You know, it's obviously it's done to death in like dubstep and stuff like that. But, um, you know, if you do it, you know, obviously dubstep is all about the kind of like impact and the, that kind of heaviness. But, you know, if you do it like with the really kind of subtle, um, uh, you know, s subtle envelopes and, you know, like small LFO amounts and things. You can create sounds which sound like really, really like delicate and in intricate, you know, just using this, just using the same techniques that you would use in dubstep or whatever. Um, okay, so that's pretty much uh, all the bass sounds I have. Um, it's maybe, no, I think that's, that's pretty much them all. Um, and it's quite nice when you make these kind of multi-part bass lines as well, because if you, you know, like I like to, I like to switch things up in the middle of the track, um, and you know, have like a, I guess you can call it like a, a bridge section, um, which you know, kind of comes before the 
before the breakdown, um, and I like to you know kind of change up the groove. Um, and when you've got like all these different bass parts, you can just kind of you know rearrange them, and uh, uh, it can come out sounding like totally different. And you know if, if all the bass parts have got you know envelopes which are sweeping in time with the beats and things, then you know you can reverse them and uh, stretch them and like reorder them and stuff, and you can create new grooves pretty easily. Um, okay, so I'll move on to the synth group, which is uh, probably the biggest of all the groups. <coughs> uh, again, some of these, as I say, unfortunately, I, you know, I have to create on my PC and I've only got as audio, but um, I think there should be a few that I've, uh, I can talk through. Um, so I've got I've got some wubs, yeah, which, you know, a wub is just like a name I give to something that just goes wub. Um, <laughs> You know, it's basically something which has an envelope, like a, you know, almost got, kind of like a shark fin uh, shape, you know. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, this one, I don't know what this one is. Oh, no, that was just like a little atmospheric noise. Yeah, just a kind of little resonant, just like a water drop. Um, I just kind of just stumbled across that by accident, put some reverb on it, and uh, it just kind of added, you know, added a nice little... Uh, Effect in a in a gap in the groove. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this one here I've called a uh, metal stab. It's got I think it's got kind of a metallic character to it. Not really. Uh, I think it used to have a metallic character to it, but um, yeah. Okay, you know it's uh, again you know quite quite a deep sound. You know you know I, I, that's just you know just what I like. You know I, I don't. I mean, I I do like stuff that's like you know quite heavy as well, but you know usually um, uh, I I keep things like pretty deep and try to try to bring out those that kind of like mid that low mid kind of texture, you know. So I've taken I've taken the lows out of that, and you see I've like boosted it here, um, like sort of maybe in like the five six hundred k range, and just bring out that. You know. Um, you know, it's nothing too complicated. Um, I've got, again, I've got oscillator B modulating the frequency of oscillator A. If I turn that off, that's hardly doing anything, yeah. And that's just going to, that just sits like right on the first kick drum uh, of each two bar section, so. Uh, like a kind of stab. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, the intro sound. Um, I, you know, I've played. I played around with that. Um, kind of showed you it. Basically, I made that. I made that by uh, just getting uh, like a. It's just a sine wave. Um, you know, just like a kind of like pure tone melody. Um, uh, I've made some kind of like random notes within the scale of the track, and I put some FM on it to give it um, some some more kind of, you know that, that kind of sound character, and then I just ran it through. I think I might have ran it through the the beat repeat street actually, um, and just experimented with some randomness, and uh, kind of just like recorded it in. Of course, because if you you know you're adding randomness to something, you know the way to the way to get a handle on randomness is to loop it because it's it's only random when you let it play but you start looping it it becomes ordered you know um and that's really all i did I just, it was just a simple you know bunch of notes just playing going through kind of a glitch effect and then you know recording it in and grabbing a part of it that i liked and looping it um uh i've got this sound here which i've muted for some reason but Same kind of deal. I, you know, I just used a sine wave, just used a sine wave uh, melody through a glitch thing, and just you know, just kind of got that loop. You know, it's kind of like working with the computer. You know, just letting the computer do whatever it'll do in a kind of random situation, and then finding something within that that you like. Um, okay, and then I've got like a bunch of uh, like stabs. Um, now some of these are samples, and some of these I made myself. Um, and they're uh, kind of uh, yeah, kind of quite interesting chords. 
I don't know if anyone was in Matt Donner's class yesterday, uh, and we were trying to learn how to recognize cards by uh, and intervals by um, you know understanding how it makes you feel and then trying to attach some names to that. Maybe you can tell me what these cards are, but uh, I'm not entirely sure myself. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> uh, actually, I don't understand that when I solo that, it doesn't play. Uh, okay, here we go. So, yeah, that was a sample, I don't know, I got from somewhere. Um, I believe I pitched it up quite a fair bit. Um, I think it was like a piano sample or something, and maybe pitched it up by an octave or more. But, yeah, really... Gives, gives some good impact, I think. Yeah, and uh, I've got some other ones here. Um, a little high stab. You know, it's just like putting that, you know, one thing like is a kind of general, you know, principle, I guess. Um, you know, whichever grid you're working in, you know, as I say, I'm working in the eighth triplet grid at the moment. You know, every every single grid point has the potential to be, you know, uh, an accent, you know. Um, and it's just, you know, it's kind of just up to you and your personal taste, you know. Um, but, you know, if you've, got, if you've got a grid point where nothing's hitting or, you know, maybe something is hitting but it's quite deep or whatever, then that grid point has the potential to be, uh, you know, used to create some kind of, like, accent or impact at that point, and then that can then determine a kind of a new groove. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I kind of, uh, you know, kind of on that, I mean, one of the things in terms of like getting into like the right state of mind for making music and get, getting creative and stuff, um, I, I, I kind of, I've tried to get to a place over the years where I believe that there are no bad sounds. Yeah, it's, it sounds kind of crazy, but, you know, I mean, a sound is a sound, and, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make music which has, you know, a variety of textures and frequencies, and, um, you know, when you actually start to, like, when you think about what you've got with time stretching and uh, reversing and effects and reverbs and resampling and all the tools at your disp disposal, there really are no bad sounds. I mean, you know, you can take anything and make it into something usable. And it's worth, you know, it's worth holding that belief in your mind um, because it then opens you up creatively. You know, when you are looking through sounds, you're not just, you know, spend an hour like next, next, next. You know, just grab the first sound you find and make something good with it, you know. Just do it, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it might, you know, maybe you're not going to make a, you know, you're not going to make like a classical melody from like a little blip noise. But, you know, you can make some kind of, like, blip or glitchy noise from the blip or whatever. You know, like, every sound has the potential to be used in music, you know. So... And then, yeah, I had some other stabs here, which uh, kind of just, again, just, you know, really nice kind of like emotional chords. Um, yeah. Um, so, what else we got? Um, I got, I think I have another, another wub here. I do, do rather a lot of wubs. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that one. Um, again, I've used operator. Um, it's a similar kind of deal. I'm only using oscillators B and A. Um, 
but I've got different course tuning settings, different level settings, creating the tone and obviously different waveforms from the other ones that you've heard. Um, I have a bandpass filter and yeah, I have a, an LFO with an up saw, which is what's making it go wham. Um, and uh, yeah, the LFO is yeah controlling the, the, the filter cut off. Um, uh, it's got the amounts like right up at 98, but you know, I can take that down. Again, just kind of pushes it along nicely. That's those kind of wavy envelopes that I was talking about. Um, yeah, okay. Um, what else have we got here? I've got something called Fuzz. Let's have a listen to that. Just a little gritty noise, you know. You know, each of the, you know, on their own, the, you know, they're not much, but when you put them in the right place in the groove and, you know, and they're bouncing off of everything else, you know, that, that's just the way I work, you know. Uh, you, know I, you know, I can't really play the piano, so I can't just sit down and just, like, write some, like, glorious melody, you know, so I just get all these little bits that I like and layer them together and move them about until something unexpected emerges, you know. Uh... So yeah, here I've got a squelch. I, I could, actually, I could talk a little bit about squelch because uh, squelch is very important in psychedelic music. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you know, one of one of the things that um, you know this this kind of sound is very common in psytrance and uh, uh, you know a lot of stuff. You know, you're basically getting like a saw wave or like a pulse wave or something. You know, something which has got like a you know, a kind of a sharp click in the waveform, um, and using uh, filters and pitch envelopes to kind of like sweep sweep through it. Uh, so at the moment, on this one, I'm only using I'm only using a filter envelope, um, which is just uh, you know it's got quite a lot of resonance. Give it more resonance, you know. So <clears throat> there's like a, a sound that um, uh, is quite commonly used in Psytrance, which basically involves doing what I've just done here, but also um, modulating the pitch as well. So I'll show you how it's done. So uh, let's see. Um, okay, so if I, yeah, so it's the LFO, basically the, the LFO is a uh, triangle and that's what's creating the shape there. So if I use that same LFO to control the pitch of the oscillator, so uh, frequency on here yeah and then I press this a here this will now control the pitch of oscillator a but so that's now the pitch is going up at the same way in the same way that the cutoffs going up but if I turn this the opposite way so that the pitch is going down as the frequency is going up And that's that's a squelch, you know. Um, and that's you know that's really you know all there is to it. I mean, obviously, you can do it with different waveforms and stuff. Um, like if you do it with like a pulse width, um, which uh, uh, operator doesn't actually have, but um, you know, so you've got basically a square wave, but rather than it being half up and half down, you've got just a tiny bit up, and then the rest is down. So you've just got that, you know, just coming through. And then as that as that pitches down, you know, it really starts to get really gritty. It's like um, but then as the cutoff's going up and the resonance is going up, it's like, you know, 
really, really squelchy. Um, but you can also, um, uh, to take it even a step further, you can uh, use a sampler and load in, uh, like say, like a percussion sound, um, and take like just the attack, like say, like a you know someone's like slapping a bongo drum or something, and just take like just the attack of that bongo and then loop it. Uh, and then pitch pitch that up and down and put the the cut off and you can get some like really cool textures you know so that's like pitch and cut off with a bandpass filter you know going to the same envelopes opposite ways or the same way you know uh, this yeah you can have endless amounts of fun yeah yeah so you can make some cool stuff with that uh, but yeah I'm probably uh, I'm not going to worry about getting it back to how it was. Um, <laughs> I'll just save it as something different. Um, yeah, because we're actually running out of time. Um, <clears throat> so, what else have I got? I've got a croak, um, which, uh, you know, I kind of like sounds that have a kind of violy character to them. You know, they're used a lot in dance music. But um, you, you can you feel like when you hear like a violy sound, you feel like you can kind of relate to it. You can almost kind of feel it in your throat. Um, I, I'm not sure how I made that exactly. I used a, a synth called Zeta Plus. Um, yeah, I remember. Um, this I used uh, two bandpass filters. So, um, you know, the if, if you look, uh, actually, this is this is quite interesting. In the EQ for uh, Ableton, uh, it has a bunch of presets. Which uh, mimic the um, the character of different uh, uh, vocal sounds. You know, uh, if you take like A for example. Okay, so you see here, it's basically got um, a few different peaks uh, at sort of like I mean, like the first peaks at like 730 hertz, and this one here at like two 2.5 kilohertz, um, and you know all the different vowel sounds. <laughs> kind of look a bit like that. So there's E, um, this one's kind of higher up, uh, and there's like uh, I, um, and O, and so on. But you can see that more or less, that they, they all have like two kind of narrow bumps, which kind of move around. Um, so, you know, if you have a synth like, uh, like Massive, uh, you know, most people are familiar with Massive, that's got two parallel oscillators, like Ableton's built-in synth only has one uh, one filter, sorry. Um, like Massive has two filters, which you can have in parallel. So if you have these two band passes in parallel and you're modulating them individually, um, you can you can get some pre pretty interesting uh, like vowel tones coming through. And that was how I made that sound, basically. Um, I had two filters which were moving near to each other and I got a kind of Take that off. Yeah. Um, okay, and let's see. Here's my kind of like jazzy stabs. Um, you've already heard these. Um, again, note, note the envelope, you know, um, kind of whippy with the envelope thing. Uh, I just, yeah, I just love sounds with that kind of shape to them. You know, I kind of like think of the envelope as like, the, you know, the br kind of like brush strokes, you know, in paintings, you know, the the, um, the, the, the brush strokes are kind of what make the, the form. And I think the envelope, I think of envelopes in the same way, you know, often when I'm making music, I, like I'm, get, I'm getting like visions at the same time. Like I can, you know, they're barely perceptible, but just kind of like just at the surface of my mind, I can like see the sounds I'm working with. And it's usually the envelopes that create the shape of the sounds that I'm seeing in my mind um, and uh, the you know the, the the frequency content which kind of creates the color you know um, I think there you know there are some parallels you know there's some parallels between uh, like geometry and sound and stuff which I was going to talk about I might still talk about but um, it's like 20 to 10 so uh, <clears throat> Yeah, and then, okay, so moving over then towards the breakdown stuff, I've got a whole bunch of, like, new sounds which come in the breakdown. Really kind of, like, quite quite melodic uh, 
jazzy kind of mellow stuff, which is kind of, kind of a, a new thing for me. Like most of the stuff I've made so far has been, you know, really kind of like techy. But this is just how I was feeling at the time. Uh, so if I just, I'll just mute this synth group for now. And uh, let's get the pads as well. Yeah, so there's a few, a few interesting techniques there that um, uh, I'd like to share with you. Um, the first one is like what I've done with the vibes here. Um, let me just mute that. Okay, so you might notice that um, the loop length is actually uh, three bars and one beat, which I don't know if people do that often, but um, this is another thing that's really good for creativity. Um, if you make loops which don't actually loop every bar or every two bars or every four bars, but actually loop kind of in between, um, then you know they come around at different points as you're listening. So uh, it creates this, like, like with the beat repeat street, it creates kind of an element of randomness and unpredictability. So as you're, as you're listening, uh, it's kind of changing, and you're not hooking into a particular loop. And I find that's I find that's really good for my creativity. In fact, sometimes has anyone heard of the Fibonacci numbers? Yeah. Sometimes I use the Fibonacci numbers. So uh, it's like uh, it's a mathematical series which is made from adding the two numbers previous to it. So it goes one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, so on. So sometimes I'll create a, a loop which is uh, a loop which is one bar long a loop which is two bars long, one which is three bars long, and one which is five bars long. And then I'll just, you know, stretch them out to whatever, 32 bars. And if they're all melodic, then they, they you know, every time it comes around, like, it's something different, you know. And, you know, you have to choose your sound carefully, and, you know, you've you got, you got to tweak the sound, obviously. But um, it's a really great technique for creating kind of like an endlessly changing melody um, yeah so <clears throat> I've done that with the vibes you know as I say um, so so they're not obviously playing any particular melody they're just adding little little kind of particles of melody throughout the breakdown You know, there's some consistency to it, but it's not, you can't really place where it begins or ends or, you know, what it's doing. So, um, I quite like that. So, just last bit here. There, I'm just using basically a sine wave with a bit of frequency modulation at the start to create that pop. And I think also that's looping in a weird, uh, a weird timing as well. Um, <clears throat> what have we got here? Yeah, again, just a sine wave. It's got a little bit of uh, bit crushing on it. And I've used Ableton's uh, time stretching feature, which is what gives it that um, effect on the first note. It's just, yeah, just time stretching. Just basically two notes, you know, very simple, but with time stretching, it adds a kind of glitchy, um, glitchy element to it as well. Um, and then I've got this one here, which I've called Techie Spikes or something. Um, again, 
again, just a supportive sound, just to like sit between all those different, you know, little, as I say, particles of sound that are happening um, to make up that, that kind of melodic section in the breakdown. Um, okay, so I've got some, I got some pads and sweeps and things. Uh, this one here. It's actually a really powerful sound, um, and uh, I made that using diversion. And it's, uh, I don't even think I'm not using, I don't, so, <laughs> excuse me, uh, I don't think I'm using uh, filters here at all. This is all oscillator parameters, so um, sweeping with the envelope, basically the waveform is changing. Um, you know, it has a ton of different oscillator parameters, basically. Uh, also, since, since like Zebra, um, uh, massive is good. It has a kind of wave, t wave table position, intensity, these kind of things. You know, when you start modulating those, and you're so you're not always having to work with like low pass filters or band pass filters or whatever. Um, you know, you got a tweak, but you can find some really, really interesting tones. I have this kind of like a deep pad sound. You know, I listen to a lot of like deep chill out music and this was just kind of like really inspired by, by that kind of stuff. Uh, um, so I've used the operator for that. And I have some automation here as well. Um, if you look down here, this red line. Uh, so it's going kind of up and down and up and down. That's basically controlling the cutoff point for this pad. Um, I'll go over quickly how I made the pad. Uh, so I've used all four oscillators. Um, and I have uh, B modulating A, as with in the other ones. Uh, and then I have C running in parallel to that with D modulating C. So you can see down here this little cube. Uh, that basically means that you know the, the green one is modulating the yellow one and the uh, orange one is modulating the blue one, uh, which corresponds to those four squares there. Um, let's see. And I've got it playing in a, a just a D minor chord, uh, I think. Yeah. You know, simple. Yeah. Um, You know, it's get, getting that kind of thickness in the pads, you know, that is, is usually the challenge with pads. Um, you can see here, for example, I've adjusted the fine tuning of the second two oscillators. Um, that's set up to five and that's up to 18. Um, I've also, the phase of each of the oscillators I've changed as well. So they're all starting at different points in the waveform and they're slightly detuned from each other. Um, and that gives a kind of thickness to the sound. And then when you play three notes at once, or you know three or more notes at once, um, you you get even more thickness. And then you apply the filter filter to that, and uh, it's it's got this really kind of like almost like liquid like texture to it. Um, okay. Um, so I've nearly been through all the tracks. Uh, You know, that was, uh, again, it's just like a, I think it's a minor chord uh, stab I made with the, another synthesizer. Um, but what I did with that that uh, I thought was quite nice was I put a bit of pitch bending at the start. So um, it actually uh, it starts maybe a few semitones off and then just like bends up. Yeah, as well as having all the, uh, uh, you know, the cutoff modulation on it as well. And I think some like flanging and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, finally here I've got. Yeah, kind of a 
minor major kind of chord progression, um, which I also made in Zeta, uh, Zeta 2, um, which I don't need to go into right now. So and on this, just this last track here, um, <coughs> basically, uh, again, this is a PC-only tool, but I'm sure this thing's for, uh, like it on the Mac. There's a, a delay called Bionic Delay. Uh, it's very old, but it just sounds great. Um, it has a cool kind of uh, property whereby when you turn the feedback up to about 60%, um, it starts to, the, the delay starts to grow. And so if you get it on a, you know, you, you, you get it on a knob or whatever, you can send stuff to that delay and then you can really ride it around about that 60% point. So then it's, it's kind of grows and swells and stuff. And basically I sent like a, I sent a few of the chord stabs uh, to that delay and, uh, and used it to build up the intensity towards the breakdown. So, um, yeah, it's created a really nice, uh, nice kind of texture. And you can, you know, you, you got you can get real precise control over it. It's really cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, that just about cover. That, I guess that covers like all the, you know, all the elements in the track. Um, you know, uh, I'm sorry. You know, as I say, some of the synths I used, uh, I wasn't able to like demonstrate here because I could have showed you some really cool techniques with that. But um, uh, you know, hopefully next time I'll be able to uh, show you some stuff there. Um, is there any anything anyone wants to ask? Uh, any questions? Can we see the the mixer and the, the the levels for all of these tracks? Is that is it already here? My um, yeah, that's not quite so easy actually in this particular view in Ableton. Uh, I mean, in the session view, you have a mixer like this. Um, I could probably show you it that way. Yeah, uh, open them all up. Am I always negative two on my master? Well, here. <laughs> Uh, no, it was down a little bit, but um, yeah, I usually try to uh, I keep you know keep the channels you know down a fair bit, like sort of like minus six or even lower, um, just to keep keep that headroom free. But um, yeah, no, I just had it cranked up because I was working on on headphones earlier. <laughs> Do you have a steady roll for your kick and bass, like your where you're setting the levels? A steady. Like just a, do you have a rule? Like some people say negative tw twelve for a kick, negative ten for. Um, not really, no. Um, I just kind of, yeah. I mean, I try to give myself some headroom, but uh, you know, I I don't have a strict rule on it. Yeah. Oh God, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's you know. I was gonna I was gonna talk a bit about creativity if you you know if you'll let me uh, I've got some other slides I'll uh, just talk about some general stuff um, before you go yeah hello <laughs> I'm pretty interested in what you said before when you said you would build your track without any drums uh -huh. at the beginning yeah do you have any other like little like, sort little secret things that you do well um. Yeah, I mean, the way, you know, I've got a few other tracks I've been working on at the moment and uh, I've been working on recently, sorry, um, where I've, I've worked that way. And, you know, like a good way to, to work quickly would be, I, I would say, to get um, a 16 or 32 bar loop. Like I say, start with like no drums or maybe, you know, maybe just a hi-hat or something just to give the rhythm and then build up lots of melodic layers and stabs and like kind of question and answer stuff you know you got so you got your stab at the start of the bar and then something kind of at the end of the four bar section um you know maybe some glitchy noises just like lots of texture and lots of layers but like don't worry about the the drums or whatever and then take that that 16 32 bar loop once it's sounding nice and full um and then duplicate it into another loop uh and then take out lots of the sounds so um you know, because there'll be a new combination of the tracks you've already made that you haven't heard together on their own yet. You know what I mean? Because you're just adding one after another. 
and you kind of duplicate it and start taking some of them out, and then you have like a new sound space, space to work in, and then add more sounds to that. And if you do that three times, uh, and obviously, you know, in, in one of them or, or two of them, uh, you know, put, put some drums in and a bass line and stuff, then you have kind of like three, you know, three distinctly different sort of 32-bar uh, loops, which are like, you know, roughly a, a minute a piece. Um, and then to then arrange the track, it's really just a case of like joining them up, you know, with automation and stuff like that. Um, that's quite a good way to work. Um, yeah, I mean, if, you know, if I can, I mean, I've just got some slides. I won't take too much more of your time. I know it's like it's like five to ten. I'll just whiz, whiz through some of these. Um, you know, I was just going to talk a bit about creativity because that's a, you know, it's a big thing I guess we probably all struggle with unless you're really fortunate and you can just like knock out a track every day. Like uh, Mr. Bill. Anyone know Mr. Bill from New Zealand? Yeah. The guy's an absolute genius. Like he makes the most like technically brilliant, emotionally deep, like music I've ever heard in my life. He's got 125 tracks on SoundCloud. He makes a track a day, like he, you know, a track in eight hours, like, and it's just supremely technical. I, I, I don't know how he does it. I, to be honest, I take bloody ages uh, writing tracks, and I think a lot of it is, you know, it's not that I don't know how to write a track. I think a lot of it's in the mind, you know, it's like doubt, you know, you used to, if you listen to something for too long, you start to doubt it and, uh, you know, you think you can take things deeper or take them further or whatever, um, you know, so I was, I was going to say like there was, you know, some studies done on creativity in the 70s, um, they were looking at like what made people creative as opposed to people who, you know, uh, thought they weren't creative. I mean, I think everybody is ultimately creative, but, um, <clears throat> and, uh, they found that like the really creative people, the things that um, the, the the kind of uh, attributes that they had, uh, you know, it wasn't they weren't necessarily more intelligent or you know uh, you know from a wealthier family or <laughs> whatever, not, you know, nothing like that. They they found that basically the people who were most creative were able to get themselves into uh, a particular mood, and that mood was uh, like playfulness, you know. Um, and they distinguish between kind of what they called like an open mind state and a closed mind state, um, you know, characterized by these kind of attributes. You know, an open mind would be playful, experimental, like, you know, no expectations about what's going to happen as a result of your actions. You know, you're just doing it just out of curiosity. Uh, it's kind of just like fearless and fun. Um, whereas people who couldn't be creative so much, you know, they were more kind of serious and goal oriented, you know, very kind of logical and formulaic and, um, you know, it's really kind of a, like a, a left brain, right brain kind of thing. Um, and there's a, there's a fabulous talk on YouTube by John Cleese um, uh, on creativity, and he talks about this in a lot more detail. And he said that they actually found that the quickest way to go from a closed state of mind to an open state of mind is humor. Uh, it's like laughter, you know. Um, it kind of like very quickly switches us into that kind of creative mind state. So... Yeah, you know, if you're feeling, um, you know, if you're feeling stuck creatively, I don't know, go and watch Family Guy or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about recently in regards to creativity is, you know, uh, as I was saying about everything being vibration, um, the human body is really a kind of, it, it itself is a kind of like vibrational kind of matrix, but um, it processes uh, absorbs and transmits vibrations and some of the things that you, you might think as like inputs would be uh, you know thoughts like other people's thoughts our own thoughts uh, you know information in media food and drink you know our environment and any kind of like art or music and stuff that we enjoy you know so think about all that you know think about think about it vibrationally you know um, like I started thinking about like my food and drink for example you know in in nature, like things with things which are alive, like plants and animals and all that, when you look at them like really close up, like microscopically, they have like beautiful like harmony in them and geometry, um, and you know they're, they're they're living things, you know, and they're they're flawless, um, you know. But a lot of the food we eat has all that harmony like hammered out of it, you know, things like bread and biscuits and whatever, you know, uh, you know all this all the kind of junk food that a lot of people eat. You know, all that harmony is kind of hammered out of it, and it's actually vibrationally, like, very dissonant, you know. Um, so I think, like, you know, like, raw foods and organic foods and stuff like that are, 
I mean, I mean you know, obviously you, you get that advice from anyone, you know, you know, be healthy kind of thing. And uh, that's something that's big for me right now, basically. Um, and but, you know, if you think as you think about it vibrationally, you know, as a, as a musician, you're creating vibrations. So, you know, you need to be absorbing the best quality vibrations you can from your environment, I think, to create the best quality vibrations you can. And food and drink's a big part of that, you know, and obviously art and music and information. You know, I'm very picky about what I will look at now on the internet uh, because, you know, you, you, can't, you can't really forget that shit. You know, once it goes in, it's in you, it's part of you, it's part of your vibrational structure. You know, uh, so, I, you know, I don't watch the news or anything like that anymore because it just doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't really help me make music. Um, <clears throat> that's my baby girl, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, having fun with paint, you know, and it's messy, you know, and sometimes to be creative, uh, you got you to gotta get your hands dirty, you know, and just kind of have fun, and not really care. Uh, one thing I find really, really good, I would ha highly recommend is keeping a journal. Um, I, you know, started doing this maybe three months ago. Uh, it's like uh, it's just been amazing like the stuff that comes out i do it as soon as i get up in the morning <clears throat> i make myself write a couple of pages um and <clears throat> at first that was all i was doing i was just writing two pages in the morning but now i have it like by my side when i'm making music and when i get a good idea i write it down and you know one thing it's really helped me to do is like really clarify my intentions um and of course your intentions are extremely important because the more precisely you can clarify your intentions, then the more precisely you can create the kind of uh, life and the kind of reality that you, you, you want to create, you know. Um, <clears throat> meditation and yoga, you know, just the, basically the ability to get yourself into a completely calm, clear mind. Really good because, you know, as I say, like I'm not making egotistical music. I'm trying to go deeper than the ego. So if I spend all my time thinking about stuff, then I'm not going to have much awareness of those deeper vibrations in my body and my soul and things like that. So, you know, I try to do meditation and yoga as often as uh, I can be bothered. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I try to do it as often as I can, basically. And just clearing the mind, you know, can, can really help. You know, exercise, still struggling with that one, but I'll get there one day. Uh, you know, laughter, appreciation, you know, really appreciating things. Appreciate a flower, you know. Just, you know, the flowers are amazing, but, you know, have you ever looked at one for more than about five seconds or ten seconds, you know? Um, you know, the same with, like, art and stuff like that, you know, like, really allow it, let it into you, and you're, you're letting those vibrations in, and then you have, uh, a, a, you know, a better set of vibrations within you at your disposal for making music. Um, and, yeah, you know, the bad, kind of bad habits, you know, self-limiting beliefs you talked about, being judgmental, you know, judging other people, you know, when you judge someone else, you're just kind of, you're blocking out a whole spectrum of stuff from your own being, you know, you're kind of pushing it away, and, you know, I try not to judge people, and uh, it's not to be too serious about things, and, you know, just, just, just kind of let it in, just appreciate things for what they are, um, and it will give you more to work with creatively. Um, I'll talk about that. I was going to talk a bit about relationships between geometry and all this kind of stuff, but, you know, it's 10 o'clock on a Thursday night. Uh, I'll leave that for another session. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock. So thank you all. Thank, thank you all for coming and listening. Thank <laughs> you.